welcome back to this course on critical learning on forest and adivasi rights this part of the course will explore the manner in which forest rights act connects with other laws and in this particular video we begin that process with environmental law we will first undertake an overview of the law on environment and then understand the place of forests and the forest rights act in the context of environment protection it was not very long ago that we realized the sheer extent of environmental degradation we also drew the connection with climate change and how humanity had played a huge role in the process political ecologists have been pointing towards a series of interrelated crises and drawing connections between natural disasters and political economies of urbanization and agri business under neoliberal governance it has also been discovered that our legal and political structures pave a path for economic extraction and disturbing critical ecosystems making it far more likely that new pathogens like novel coronavirus emerged out of our own doing In 1984 we had the Bhopal gas tragedy in India and such kind of incidents have continued ever since Vishakhapatnam had a gas leak in May 2020 coupled with a series of environmental mishaps deforestation and polluting of water bodies we are today standing at a point of no return so a law for environment has the humongous burden of protecting it for present and for the future and this protection needs to be extended while also distributing resources equitably and meeting the demands of the populace and it is in this context that environmental law has emerged coming at a very high cost we also need to realize that it is possible that the cost of its failure may be incalculable Let us first understand what the law entails and what it seeks to do. By 1970s, developed countries had begun the process of framing international law on environmental protection and establishing safeguards against its degradation. Many international agreements were signed, like the Stockholm Conference of 1972, Convention of Biodiversity 1992. and the kyoto protocol of 1997 india followed suit and enacted the air prevention and control of pollution act 1981 the environment protection act 1986 among many others to honor its commitments under these international agreements today we have about 10 legislations at the central level other than many notification and state level laws rules and regulations These laws are mostly regulatory in nature meaning that the state is entrusted with the power and responsibility to maintain the environment but one of the things that we need to understand at the outset is that environment protection is not only the prerogative of the state but also the right and duty of every person like the environment environmental law is also the responsibility of everybody article 48a of the constitution requires the state to protect and improve the environment and to safeguard forests and wildlife article 21 of the constitution of india recognizes a fundamental right of every person in the country to a clean environment but right to clean environment is accompanied by duty to protect it as well article 51a clause g bestows a fundamental duty on every citizen to protect the environment forests and wildlife the courts have over the years constructed various principles to establish a strong environmental regime in india a number of them like the polluter pays principle principle of sustainable development will be discussed in the next video for this lecture we will concentrate on two of them the first is the principle of absolute liability 
the Supreme Court of India conceived of the absolute liability principle in the case of M.C. Mehta versus Union of India. This principle states that the complete liability for compensating for any loss to the environment in case of a hazardous activity, whether out of a mistake or negligence or not, is entirely on the entity that polluted in the first place. The other and possibly the most important principle in today's context is the doctrine of public trust. The doctrine of public trust makes the state the custodian of all natural resources, meaning that the state holds natural resources as a trustee on behalf of the people and it is the responsibility of the state to protect them. Distinguishing environmental elements like air, water, forests from private property, this doctrine clarifies the manner in which resources need to be distributed for environment protection. This role of the state as the trustee is juxtaposed with its powers of eminent domain under which the state has powers to acquire land for the purposes of development. Executive agencies of the government such as Finance Ministry, Ministry of Mines, Ministry of Coal and the Ministry of Power use this power of eminent domain to acquire land for setting up industrial parks special economic zones, extractive industries and mega hydro power projects. But that power is not absolute. The constitutional mechanism and environmental laws flowing from it provide adequate checks and balances to curb arbitrary decision making by such agencies of the government. There are detailed legal processes that are mandated to be followed in every developmental project affecting the environment. Under the Environment Protection Act and the Forest Conservation Act, every developmental project needs to obtain environmental clearance and forest clearance before they begin their activities of resource extraction. To preempt as well as contain the adverse effects of extractive industry on environment and local ecology, six different types of processes are employed. First is the environmental clearance under Environment Impact Assessment, also known as the EIA. This is a process stemming from Environment Protection Act 1986 and the next lecture is dedicated to it. The second is the Coastal Regulation Zone Clearance under the CRZ notification. The Coastal Regulation Zone notification was issued in 1991 under the Environment Protection Act 1986. These rules regulate industrial and human activity near the coast for conservation of ecosystems that exist near the coastal lines. The rules define coastal areas and limit such constructions or storage or dumping hazardous materials. The Coastal Regulation Zone Notification 2018 has diluted India's only protection system for the fragile ecology and opened it up to realtors and large-scale development projects. The third is the Forest Clearance under Forest Conservation Act and the requirement of compensatory afforestation. Forest clearance is obtained under the Forest Conservation Act 1980 by which the central government regulates deforestation. This process has been discussed in detail in the next lecture. The fourth is the process of grant of reconnaissance permit, prospective license and mining lease for extractive mining industries which seeks to protect the environment from damage caused due to mining. This will also be discussed in the upcoming videos. The fifth is the consent to establish and the consent to operate under the air and water pollution laws. These are procedures under the air and water pollution acts that seek to minimize air and water pollution. And the sixth is groundwater control. The law of groundwater control operates through central and state groundwater control boards and classifies different areas in the country as overexploited, 
critical, semi-critical, safe and saline in order to regulate pollution of groundwater. Some kind of industries require special permission, especially if they are to operate in a critical area. Law relating to groundwater is a state subject and therefore every state would have a different law. Under these processes, various executive wings of the government and committees discuss, assess and decide the viability of the project based on the extent of harm it may unleash on the environment and wildlife. Some of these processes will be discussed in length in the upcoming videos. One other lesser known thing about environmental law is that under the Indian Penal Code, certain activities polluting the environment are considered as environmental crimes. Fictionalized as nuisance under criminal law, this provision is a powerful tool to put an immediate stop to the polluting activity. Section 133 of the Code of Criminal Procedure has been used over a period of time for the purpose of environment protection and the interest of the community. The Supreme Court has declared that it is the magistrate that has the duty to public who is suffering the nuisance and so he shall exercise it when the jurisdictional facts are present. Ratlam v. Vardhi Chand is one of those cases where the court took a firm standing against environment pollution and decided that it was the responsibility of the state to maintain the environment. In Ward No. 12 of Ratlam, filth and dirt had been increasing due to a lack of drains and sewage facilities. This was compounded by the discharge from a liquor factory which was flowing into an open drain located in the middle of the main road. The STM found that the facts were proved and to stop the nuisance from continuing, he directed the municipal council to construct drains with flowing water that could wash away the dirt and the stink. But when the case reached High Court, the state argued that the people of the area had chosen to live in that locality, fully knowing its condition and therefore cannot hold the state accountable for the situation. Justice Krishna Ayer was finding himself lucky that such a plea was not brought before him in the Supreme Court. He called the plea ugly and found it outrageous that such a plea was made at all. One other significant aspect of environment is that people and communities have been tirelessly trying to protect it. The legendary Chipku Andolan of 1973 or the Balrampur struggle of November 2018 from Odisha against deforestation for beer factory or even the Plachimara struggle for water against Hindustan Coca-Cola Limited where people, particularly women, can be seen committed to save the environment, even if it is at the cost of their own lives. These women hugging trees and marching to improve the health of their environment are living embodiments of the concept of care for the environment and the acceptance that certain things are bigger than our ceaseless need for development. They are doing what environmental law often fails in doing. The legal regime has changed in the last 35 years. As you will see the other videos on environmental law, you can decide for yourself if we are in any way equipped to handle another Bhopal or prevent it from occurring at all. The next video discusses the process of environment impact assessment. Thank you for watching.